It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. Today, I'm going to revisit two very popular topics on the podcast. First, Series I savings bonds. Is it time to buy or time to sell? I'll tell you what I think. And later, the scales are starting to tip. Ooh, bad pun. When it comes to gratuities, are you getting fed up? Or do you think those complaining about gratuities everywhere you turn need to just zip it up? So we're going to talk about that. But right now, I-bonds became the number one thing that people reached out for advice, help, and understanding to our Team Clark Consumer Action Center, where you can, for free, as we have for 30 years, get answers to questions you have about your wallet. And it's an area that confuses people no end, but provided an eye-popping return at a time that other things that you could put your money into, saving CDs, were paying basically nothing. Well, now... The questions coming in to both us here on the podcast and to our Team Clark Consumer Action Center are, well, now the rates on I-bonds apparently are headed down and savings rates and CDs and money market fund rates have gone up. Should I sell the series I-savings bonds that I just bought in the last two years? And by the way, other people are saying, hey, is it still a good time to buy Series I savings bonds? So first, a basic on Series I savings bonds. Series I, I stands for inflation. The idea of Series I's is they give you the rate of inflation. So normally on savings, you're falling behind inflation with your savings because savings – That's money you put aside that there's no risk that you're going to lose any of the money you have in something. But the risk you face is the risk of purchasing power, that over time, the dollars you put into savings earn less than the rate of inflation. So enter Series I savings bonds. You can buy up to 10 grand of them in a year. They have been paying eye-popping rates during this inflationary cycle we've been in. And in fact, if you buy them in the next few weeks, they will pay, and you got to do this in April, uh, they pay 6.89% for how long? The next six months. Because every six months, the rate on Series I savings bonds resets based on the rate of inflation. So before that, they were paying nearly 10% when inflation was out of control, and then inflation started coming down, and then the last six-month cycle uh, through the next couple of weeks, they've been paying 6.89%. And then with the reset coming for May, and you can't wait till the last day of April to buy these. you got to buy them, uh, I'd say, no later than about the 25th of April to know that you have the current rate on I-bonds, the rate will reset. And the likeliest guess uh, of economists and financial people is we're going to be somewhere around 3.5% with the reset. And so you face every six months that whatever the rate of inflation has been in the prior period, that's what you're going to earn on these going forward. Except people who buy them right now get a bonus. You get, for the, as long as you want to hold them from a minimum of a year to a maximum of 30 years, you get whatever the rate of inflation is each six-month cycle plus a bonus of 0.4 of a percent. So almost a half a percent booster shot above the rate of inflation. So I see it as a pretty safe bet that you buy right now because even if you look at The best rates on savings accounts right now, the best rates on CDs, best rates on money markets, you're all right around 5%. Where the Series I savings bonds, if you buy them 
during these next uh, few weeks, you're going to get a rate of 6.89% for the next six months. Question mark after that, likely somewhere like 3.5%. You blend those two, and where are you? You're still over 5% for the year. Now, this is where it gets tricky, and this is where all the questions that have been coming into us about, hey, I bought Series I savings bonds when they were paying really high rates. The rates are going down. Should I bail? So you sell Series I savings bonds anywhere between uh, first year of ownership and fifth year, you forfeit the last 90 days of interest. So you don't want to sell during a time where that last 90 days would have been a really hefty rate of interest. Plus, particularly people who bought this cycle, where you get the inflation rate plus a bonus of 0.4%, there's a really strong case I can make that you would want to hold these for a significant period of time, unless financial circumstances change radically because you know that you're making your savings do something really great for you, you're riding with inflation, plus getting that booster shot, that bonus of the four-tenths of 1%, basically almost half a percent booster over the rate of inflation. So if you want to know how to buy these, go to savingsbonds.gov, and it'll take you to Treasury Direct. You'll see how to buy them. Really easy to buy, but remember... You want to not procrastinate. You want to get the current rate because you let the month flip and the rates are going to be roughly half likely what they are right now. And if you buy them now, you come in under the current rate for the next six months. And I know I just created another 40 questions in people's minds. I guess it's the government. It has to be complicated, right, Krista? Of course, of course. I bought um, the not this cycle, but the one before. So I guess. So I'm you gonna... get you get no inflation booster shot. Right. You don't get the point four, but you get something really good, which is you got the nearly ten percent, and mm-hmm. now you're in the nearly seven percent. So your blend is better than you could have done anywhere else. And I still own I-bonds. They are only good for 30 years. I still own I-bonds from way back in the way back machine uh, more than 20 years ago when you got the rate of inflation plus three percentage points, three full percentage points. So it's been quite a ride. And I know there are so many people who are longtime listeners to our show who bought them back a generation ago that are just sitting pretty holding those series I savings bonds. So I have it too, but I only bought a hundred dollars worth. Oh, you <laughs> so have one from back. I have one from back when I was like forever ago. I was yeah, I've, for you. I've got stacks of them because they used to be paper bonds and uh, don't worry, they're in a safe. Good. Okay. We'll go to some questions now. This one's from Chris in Louisiana. Bank failures are scary. Nearing retirement, we are fortunate to have cash in a retirement account at Schwab. Within the account, we've purchased several jumbo CDs. The CDs are from different banks, but all through the same Schwab account. How much FDIC insurance do we have? Is it $250,000 because that is the account limit? Or because these CDs are through different banks, are we covered in full? Lunch and bragging rights are riding on this. Okay, so first of all, Chris. These, these are great problems to have, that you have multiples of a quarter million in CDs. You are fully insured for all of them. Schwab and any uh, brokerage, when they, do, uh, when they do these CDs for large amounts of money for wealthy individuals like yourself, they keep you below 250 at each institution. So as they do what are called broker place CDs, it's multiplying the FDIC insurance. And by the way, the FDIC is fine with this. It's not looked at as a loophole. The FDIC wants to spread out the risk because some financial institutions are solid and well run, others not so much. And so the program at Schwab and Fidelity, where they do the brokerage place CDs, lowers the risk for the FDIC fund anyway. 
So you're safe, and it keeps the FDIC system safer. So you're good. Brokerage place CDs are great because usually you're getting a much higher interest rate through their system than you would placing walking right into the front door of a bank branch. From Matthew in Georgia, my wife and I made a pact for some time soon that we would take a break from social media. Thinking about how we fill that time, I decided to try and learn more about something I've wanted to do before jumping into any new investments, which is to understand what everything means. Sure, I get that you advise investing in a Roth IRA, but when it comes down to it, there's a lot of intimidating decisions regarding what types of target this or index fund that, which I don't fully understand. So while I'm forgoing social media, I wanted to occupy that time with some books and wanted to see if you might have suggestions on something I can read so that when I step up to the plate and start investing in our Roth IRA, I'll know what all the options are that I have, how to interpret them, and what's best for our situation. All right, I'm going to give you a number of suggestions. Um, I'm going to start with this, and I'm not going to mention books because there's a lot of information available that will get you what you want and give you the understanding about what I call the houses, which is like Roth IRA, traditional IRA, 401k, uh, for our poor suffering teachers, the vastly inferior 403b, all that. That's the house. And then you furnish the house with what you invest your money in. And so when you mention target this, index that, um, it's actually much easier than the lingo and terminology might make you think. So where would I like you to start? I'd like you to start uh, by subscribing to the free newsletter from Humble Dollar. It is the uh, product edited by Jonathan Clements. And uh, Jonathan Clements is a uh, brilliant financial writer who writes personal finance in language that we can all grasp And you will, by following Humble Dollar, you'll really have a sense where you'll really be able to add understandable meat to the bones of how investing works. Also, I just mentioned uh, Schwab and Fidelity, and I'll throw in Vanguard as well. All three have education centers that explain how various investment accounts work and how various funds work. And the information is written not, a lot of it's not investing 101, it's probably like 201, but the combination of reading the material from each and how they present it, I think you'll be good. Also, if any terminology confuses you, go to investopedia.com that, by the way, if you have a uh, elementary school kid in your house, middle school or high school, Investopedia now has a very good series of educational tools to teach kids of various ages how investing works and particularly the high school oriented material for someone who doesn't understand investing really at all it just confuses you um you can go read the high school material they have and it's actually very well written to explain how the fundamentals of investing work Uh, for one thing that i know confuses people Target retirement funds. If you do a target retirement fund in your 401k or your IRA, the idea is that's where all your money goes. It's already set up to split out into different investment categories. I find a lot of people will say, well, I'm putting part of my money in the target retirement fund, then I'm putting some of it over here and this and part of it over there and that. The idea of the target retirement fund is it's a one-stop shop for the year closest to when you expect to retire, and that's what you put all your money in. It's the easy button for investing in a Roth IRA, traditional IRA, or 401k. And from Lance in Utah, this is probably old news, but I feel like I've been had and wanted to warn others. I've had Capital One accounts for many years, going back to when they were ING. I just realized today that my old savings accounts called 360 Savings are only paying 0.3% interest, but their website advertises 3.4%. It turns out their new accounts are called 360 Performance Savings, and those are the ones that paid the 3.4%. To get the higher rate, I have to open a new savings account and transfer the money into the new account. 
I don't ever remember being notified, and after research online, this change was made several years ago. Am I wrong to want to move my money to a bank that is more honest than this? This is a problem throughout the financial industry. In fact, uh, this came up in a conversation about Charles Schwab recently, that Charles Schwab defaults to putting your money in an account that earns, I think it's 0.45%. But within Schwab, you can earn 10 times that with one simple click of the mouse and or on a smartphone, one simple transaction where you can put your money into accounts that will earn 10 times that that are in uh, U.S. Treasury obligations or government obligations. And so what, uh, what Capital One is doing is common with so many banks, credit unions, and also with the brokerages, is that if you just go with inertia, they're going to rip you off. The biggest banks in the country right now are paying one one hundredth of one percent on savings unless you specifically do something about it. One one hundredth of one percent while other people are earning five percent on savings or CDs simply by moving your money. So should you dump Capital One over this? I'd say it's so common in the industry that I would not dump Capital One because of that. I would just be aware that this is the way the industry does play dirty pool with your and my wallet. Coming up ahead, we're going to talk about something that people feel has been dirty pool. It's the iPad popping around for tips at all kinds of places. Tips were not part of the equation in the past. It seems like just breathing right now calls for a tip. Uh, Grace, who works on our social media went to a self-service car wash recently and self-service and it suggested as she was checking out a 35 percent tip on a self-service car wash so I was thinking you know if that 35 percent was like the Domino's thing where they were doing the thing where they tipped you if you came to pick up your own pizza if because it's all self-service if you got 35% off your car wash by clicking there, that would be fine. But it wasn't. The money would go to who knows who at a self-service car wash. And so this is something that people are really confused about. And the iPad has become this big guilt machine. Because you go somewhere that is a place that... Uh, that may be quick service kind of thing. Who knows what kind of place it is. And it seems that inevitably you're going to have the iPad flipped around and it's going to have suggested tip amounts. And I've noticed the percentages seem, it may be my perception, but it seems the percentages that you're expected to tip have gone up, up, up and away, starting uh, on the iPads many times at 25%. Uh, one of them, I think it's uh, the one that's so popular with the restaurants, Toast, I think, starts at 20% and just goes up from there. And I, I know that servers at so many places that are not sit-down kind of restaurants or things like that, that the people who serve you at a business are not being paid, in many cases, enough money. And so we're being expected to subsidize the wages that are substandard at so many places. It, it's a real bind that people find themselves in. And Krista, you avoid fast food. Mm -hmm. And you do so much of your life at places that are a step up from sit down, but a uh, step, step down from sit down, but a step up from my fast food world. And everywhere you go, you face this dilemma. All the time. And, you know, I think it really is, like, people are starting to get uh, upset about oh, it. Oh, there's because, definitely a backlash. Like, you during, can feel it. It started, I think, during the pandemic because you felt like, well, people were working. They're out there working. So, you know, give them more money. And, and then, but then we now we've had inflation. So you're already paying more for your food. And then you're expected, you know, when you're, you go down a line and build a salad or build something and then, at the end, you're expected to tip for it. It's hard because I, I, there's one place I go to that I love. I love them. 
it's sort of ready-made food and they're wonderful, but like I tipped them a lot before and they're not, I mean, they might be heating it up for me, but usually it's just giving me the packaged food. It's already, it's already there. Yeah. And they've made comments. To me. They're so sweet. And they're like, oh, you're so nice to tip us. Like, you're so sweet and generous. And now I feel like I have to do it every time, you know, and the food's gotten a lot more expensive. So it's a real dilemma. And there's this backlash because I think so many of us like increased our tipping during so, COVID. So I've done something in my wallet. Um, I have increased the amount of cash I'm carrying from normally because most people have like none. And I have ones and I have fives. So there's a 20 on the outside, but mostly ones and fives. And I now tip in cash and say no tip on those machines because you don't know who the money actually is going to end up in the hands of anyway when the scary iPad comes at you. Yeah. I mean, who knew an iPad could be a scary device? <laughs> but it's become one because of this terrible dilemma. So I know that some people are allergic to carrying any cash at all, um, but I recommend having some ones and fives with you and use those as a method of tipping because then, and you can hand it right to the individual who you feel is deserving of it, who has served you, instead of doing it on the mysterious iPad thing where you have no idea where that money is actually going to go because we don't know where it's going to go then. So, but all right, well, we have a tipping question for you. Um, where, oh, no, I didn't put it in today. I'm sorry. I have one coming up for you in the next few days that I'll ask oh. you, and that will oh, be an this is this is, a, a, this is a tease for it's another tease. podcast. I should have put it, it here. Okay, Shelly. Do you want to just make it up? No. Just Shelly kidding. in Montana says, will a credit card company close your account because they cannot make money from you? I receive my points from them, and that costs them money. My credit rating is 787, and all payments have been made in full and on time. However, the bank has closed both of my accounts, one with the warehouse club and one with the cell phone company that I had with them. I've tried to find out why, and they say because of invalid payments or credit score, but won't specifically give me a solid answer. What's really going on here? So, Shelly, um, credit card companies are getting scared. And the particular credit card company that you had both of these cards with, two eggs in one basket, um, is a credit card company that is very difficult to do business with. And uh, they are, they're not one of the majors, but they do a lot of co-branded cards and private label cards. And they tend to be really itchy on the trigger right now, just as you discovered your credit score could be fine, 787. I mean, your payment's always on time. And who knows what triggered their fear. And look what happened. It was double trouble all at one time. They closed your uh, warehouse club card and closed the one tied in with the cell phone carrier. And so it is the nature of who you were doing business with. And the weirdest thing, they don't have to give you a valid reason. And more and more people are going to find that the time they know that a card has been shut down is when they go to use it and the charge is declined. No notice from the issuer. We got over 40% of people running uh, significant balances on credit cards month to month. And that's making the credit card companies fearful. This particular issuer has tended to offer credit to people of lower credit scores. And that's why they, at a time like this, heading towards a possible recession, they would be closing accounts. Why they would do it to you is a complete mystery. Um, and you got to know you need to replace that credit quickly or that could impact your 787. So you need to apply for something else before their closure of those accounts reflects on your credit. The other thing I'm curious about is what happened with your points? Did they close the accounts no notice and just take your points away from you or give you an opportunity to use them. All right, this is from Maggie in Colorado. I volunteer at a local 501c3 all-volunteer radio station. I will soon be one of the programmers. Will I be able wow. to deduct the cost of my software, Adobe Audition, which is what the radio station uses, on my taxes next year? 
I know there's free software available, but the radio station does not use it. I'm only purchasing it because of this volunteer position. And by the way, it costs $21 per month if I purchase it for a year and $31 on a month-to-month plan. Thank you. Well, the the software you're looking for is very standard in radio and in the podcast environment, especially in the radio environment. And yes, you are able to take a deduction for the money you uh, spend as a volunteer. As long as you got documentation, all the rest, you're good to do that. And something so overlooked by people who volunteer is the IRS also allows you at a very low rate to deduct mileage. I think it's 14 cents a mile right now. So keep track of your mileage in your volunteer capacity so that you're able to deduct that as well. And I hope that you really enjoy being in the radio world because it's really fun. Okay, from John in California. I live in Los Angeles, and the L.A. Department of Water and Power offers a program where they will pay me up to $240 per year to rent my roof for solar panels. I don't feel buying solar is right for me since I'm less than 10 years from retirement and will move out of L.A. at that time. To be a part of the program, there's no cost to me, and the only thing I have to agree to is to stay in it for one year, and then I can have the panels removed from my house if I want to. While I don't get direct benefit from these panels, the extra $240 per year would help offset my higher power bills in the summer. Plus, I I would help in creating green power for the city. Is there any downside to this program I'm not thinking of? Yeah, your roof. Um, John, uh, you're the, I think you're the third person to ask me about one of these programs. The other two, I don't think were uh, LA Water and Power. But the, the issue when you basically lease your roof for, in this case, 20 bucks a month, if the roof is damaged in any way, first, how do you prove it? And second, how do you get a municipal entity to pay for the damage done to your roof? So I know it's appealing for the $240 to come into your wallet each year, but because of the unknown question, maybe they've given you a good answer on this. Unless you have a really solid answer you're comfortable with, if the installation of and removal of the panels in either case causes uh, damage to the roof, who's going to pay for that? Unless you've got a really rock solid answer to that, I wouldn't do it. Um, Solar is absolutely awesome and it is a way underutilized thing for residential situations but fortunately we are installing solar at a very high rate in the country and every panel that we install particularly the utility scale solar reduces the amount of energy of traditional kinds we have to use to keep the grid up and running but in this case um, it may not be the best idea for you to provide your roof. And I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Don't forget, subscribe wherever you listen or watch because it really helps us out and hopefully will help you out. And review us if you're enjoying either the audio or video version of our podcast. If you could take a moment and review us and share us with your friends. Have a great day.